Good evening to you all. My name is Christoph Barnes and I'm a senior researcher here at the Osser Institute and a research fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague. I'm also the proud co-editor of the book, Foreign Fights on International Law and Beyond, of which we celebrate the Hague launch tonight. Now last week we uh, had an equally well attended, I must say, launch at the Scuola Superior Sant'Anna in Pisa, where my two co-editors, Professor de Coutry and Dr. Capone, work. Now, before I introduce Dr. Capone and the other two panelists of tonight, Professor Edwin Bakker and Mr. Mark Singleton, to you, I would like to take this opportunity to thank a number of people. Now, first of all, many thanks should go to Professor de Guthrie and to you, Francesca. Uh, it has been a true pleasure to have worked so intensively uh, with you for so many months, and I'm proud of the result and the fact that the book has received, has been received so enthusiastically in both the academic world and the world of practitioners. In addition, I would like to thank all the other authors who have contributed to this book, including Professor Bakker and Mr. Singleton, the publishing team of Team CRC Press, our copy editor, Ms. Rydell, as well as Ms. Vignier, Ms. Venturi, and Mr. Young, who are PhD students at the Scuola Superiore, for assisting with the thematic index of the book. Now, our collected volume, uh, which was published a few months ago by Team CRC Press and Springer Verlag, is one of the first that comprehensively addresses, from various perspectives, a phenomenon that is not new to societies, but has received increasing attention in recent years and months, particularly because of the conflicts in Syria and Iraq. And this is because of the magnitude of the problem. Uh, Professor Buck and Mr. Singleton, in our book, and they will probably come back to this later, arrived at a combined estimate of a total number of more than 30,000 foreign fighters for the entire conflict in Syria and Iraq since 2011, and on 29 of May 2015, the UN Security Council expressed, and I quote, it's grave concern that there are now over 25,000 foreign terrorist fighters from over 100 countries who have traveled to join or fight for terrorist entities associated with Al-Qaeda, including ISIL and ANF, and notes that the flow is mainly focused on, but not limited to, movement into the Syrian uh, Arab Republic and Iraq, end quote. So the phenomenon of foreign fighters on which we have worked since mid-2012 is constantly evolving. And when we submitted our manuscript to the publisher, we wrote that, and I quote again, one can be assured that in between the moment this book is submitted to the publisher, the 1st of July 2015, and the moment the reader can actually hold the book in his or her hands, several new incidents and subsequent policy measures will have seen the light, end quote. And I think unfortunately this prediction couldn't have been more accurate. And after the book was published, we have seen the attacks in November 2015 in Paris, as well as the attacks in Brussels in March of this year. I had to only mention a few Western examples of attacks perpetrated by or inspired by the organization that calls itself Islamic State. Moreover, these incidents have led to a stream of new measures, especially in France, which has been diagnosed by some authors as having legislative fever. Now, because Professor de Guthrie, uh, Dr. Capone and I have always realized this, and that the book will never be able to keep up with the speed with which this phenomenon is developing, we have asked the authors of the book to not only look at daily practice, that can mainly be linked to Syria and Iraq, but also to dig deeper and to present general and more long-lasting observations that are insightful to future conflicts and dilemmas. However, you will uh, hear more about the content of the book and new developments from our distinguished panelists, about whom I will now provide some background information. Now, to start with Francesca Capone, she's a research fellow in public international law at the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, where she also serves as the didactic coordinator of the Master in Human Rights and Conflict Management. She holds a joint PhD in public international law from the Scuola and also from Tilburg University. From June 2012 to September 2013, she was a research fellow at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, and she co-authored a report on education and the law of reparations in insecurity and armed conflict. Her research interests focus on children's and victims' rights, in particular the right to a remedy and reparation. Now, after her presentation explaining the content of our volumes on 20 minutes, uh, Professor Edwin Bakker will present a chapter he co-authored uh, with Mark Singleton, entitled Foreign Fighters in the Syria and Iraq Conflict, Statistics and Characteristics of a Rapidly Growing Phenomenon. So 15 minutes. And Edwin Bakker is Professor of Terrorism and Counterterrorism Studies at Leiden University. He's Director of the Institute of Security and Global Affairs of that same university and Fellow of the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague. He studied political geography in the Netherlands and in Germany, and between 2003 and 2010, he was a fellow at the Netherlands Institute of International Relations, Klingendal, 
where he headed the Klingendal Security and Conflict Program since 2007. And his research interests at Leiden University and the ICT are, among other things, radicalization processes, jihadi terrorism, unconventional threats to security and crisis impact management. And finally, our last speaker of tonight is Mr. Mark Singleton. He's the acting head of the administrative unit of the Global Counterterrorism Forum, or GSTF, a career diplomat with over 27 years of experience in foreign affairs, development, cooperation, and security. Mark has worked in the Middle East, Afghanistan, East and West Africa, Georgia, and Europe in a variety of multilateral, bilateral, and non-governmental organizations in both advisory and senior management posts. And before joining the administrative unit of the GCTF, Mark was the director of the ICCT, and before that, acting head of mission of the Office of the Quartet Representative in Jerusalem, where he led an international team of over 60 staff to strengthen the Palestinian economy as part of the Middle East peace process. And Mark will address the latest developments, also some 15, 10 minutes. After that, we have some 30 minutes for Q&A, a brief closure from my side, a final word by Mr. Frank Bakker from Team CLC Press, and a reception kindly offered by ICT. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Francesca Capona. Again, many thanks for having accepted our invitation, and you have the floor. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. It is a true pleasure for me to be here at the Aster Institute and have the opportunity to tell you a bit more about our, vo our volume on foreign fighters under international law and beyond. But before that, I sincerely wish to uh, thank Dr. Christoph Paulsen, who has agreed to embark on this project with great enthusiasm and with whom it has been a true pleasure to work over the past several months. And Professor De Guthrie and I uh, could not have hoped for a better, more motivated and competent co-editor for this volume. I also wish to thank all the contributors to uh, our volume, in particular the two authors uh, who are with us tonight, uh, and also the Asser Press team uh, for their extremely valuable and constant support throughout the uh, whole process, from the inception uh, until the uh, final publication of the volume. Thank you so much. Uh, this evening I've been asked to briefly present our volume, strengthening in particular, which was the goal um, of our research and which are the uh, main results that we were able to achieve through this publication. Uh, so as for our goal, probably the best way to describe it is through the word understand. When we started brainstorming about the project, we asked ourselves what can we bring uh, to the current debate on foreign fighters. And uh, the answer was, well, we can actually help the reader, be it a student, an academic, a practitioner, or simply someone with an interest on this topic, to understand better who is a foreign fighter, uh, why foreign fighters decide to leave everything behind and join a conflict <coughs> miles away from their own place, uh, what kind of danger do they actually pose and which are the best ways to counter this phenomenon in an effective way. So, as for the uh, first question, who is a foreign fighter, we provided a definition in, uh, in the introduction of our volume, <coughs> according to which uh, a foreign fighter uh, refers to individuals driven mainly by ideology, religion, and or kinship who leave their country of origin or their country of habitual residence to join a party engaged in an armed conflict. So as you can see, our working definition was really broad. Um, and uh, it includes not only those who decide to side with armed terrorist groups, but also those who decide to side with government in distress. And I'm thinking, for example, of the case of Ukraine. And um, when uh, we... Um, uh, we decided to adopt such a broad definition. We also thought uh, that it was useful to achieve a twofold goal. On the first hand, it is useful because it helps to draw a better distinction between foreign fighters and foreign terrorist fighters. On the other hand, it is also very useful because it allows us to actually tackle the phenomenon of foreign, terror of foreign fighters without um, <laughs> focusing it too much on the situation in the Middle East, which is of course dealt with in our volume, but the findings are applicable also to uh, other contexts and settings. So, 
Back to the first point, the distinction between foreign fighters and foreign terrorist fighters. These two terms are often used in a confusing way, and the second term, foreign terrorist fighters, has been described in uh, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2178, adopted, as you will all remember, in September 2014, as individuals who travel to a state other than their states of residence or nationality for the purpose of the perpetration, planning, or preparation of, or participation in terrorist acts, or the providing or receiving of terrorist training, including in connection with armed conflict. So the resolution <coughs> places the, ac the accent on the terrorist intent, the terrorist purpose of these individuals who leave their country. And also the resolution makes explicit reference to the uh, two tire sanctions regime established under resolution 1267 and under resolution 1373, thus determining that the, link, the, the listing and sanctioning regimes applicable to the Al-Qaeda associates are also applicable in this case, and also that the states can inform uh, and use their own understanding of the word terrorism because this concept is not defined in resolution 2178. Therefore, for example, an Italian citizen who travels to Syria to fight and support um, uh, al-Assad's troops will not be considered as a foreign terrorist fighter, but rather as a foreign fighter. However, his or her country fellow men who join ISIL or any other terrorist group will be subject to the newly adopted Italian legislation on terrorism, which prohibits the recruitment, both active and passive, of potential terrorists, the organization, planning, and financing of trips abroad for the purposes of committing terrorist acts, and training, including both self-training and online training, to acquire knowledge and skills that can be potentially used to conduct uh, terrorist acts. So this approach is consistent with the scope of Resolution 2178, which was not to outlaw to poor foreigners' participation in armed conflict abroad, but it was rather to uh, prohibit foreigners' association with armed terrorist groups. So we tried to uh, structure our volume according to our main goal, and therefore, uh, we wanted to offer uh, a comprehensive overview of the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters. We divided the book in four parts. The first part, Foreign Fighters, a multidisciplinary overview of new challenges for an old phenomenon, begins with the excellent contribution by Edwin Becker and Max Singleton, and they will tell you more about the statistics and the characteristics of this growing phenomenon. And it then focuses on the history of foreign fighters, from Lord Byron's adventures in Greece to the role that the foreign volunteers have played in many conflicts abroad, including national liberation struggles like the Italian Risorgimento over the past two centuries and a half. So I find these two chapters particularly helpful to set the scene and highlight the difference between the romantic flavor which was associated with the foreign fighters in the past and the current approach that stresses in premise their dangerousness and the negative impact that they can have on both national and supranational security. So this first part is probably the one uh, that better uh, highlights the multidisciplinarity of our volume, as it encompasses also, also contributions that deal with the motivation that trigger the foreign fighter's choice to join a conflict abroad, the emerging role of social media in the recruitment process, the, the situation of women and girls in the ranks of uh, terrorist groups, and uh, also the challenges to crack the phenomenon of foreign fighters through the lenses of international relations and security studies. As for the first point, the motivations that actually push someone to become a foreign fighter, the authors of Chapter 5, Ross Frenet and Tanya Silverman, have identified three uh, main uh, uh, motivations uh, um, uh, through uh, a few interviews that they have conducted with former foreign <coughs> fighters involved in different conflicts and in different contexts. So the first motivation is outrage for what is, going, uh, for what is happening in a country abroad. The second motivation is the adherence to the ideology of the group that the foreign fighter is willing to join. And the third is the search for identity and belonging. 
So these motivations apply to both female and male foreign fighters, and I will just add that uh, there are a lot of personal factors that make it very difficult to analyze and, uh, the uh, foreign fighters as a group, even when they act and they travel collectively. The second part of the volume focuses on the status of foreign fighters under international branches, uh, under different branches of international law. And the first two, two chapters deal with international uh, criminal law and international humanitarian law. These chapters in particular showed us that the phenomenon of foreign fighters does not pose any particular challenge vis-a-vis -vis the existing normative framework. But it was still important to shed light on some issues, for example, the ICL mechanism available to uh, promote accountability for the conduct of foreign fighters, and also the distinction between foreign fighters and mercenaries. So contrary to popular belief, the latter category, that of mercenary, is very difficult to join. And according to Article 47, Paragraph 2 of Additional <coughs> Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, uh, there are six cumulative criteria that must be met in order for someone to be classified as a mercenary. So in light of our definition of foreign fighters, the third criterion listed in uh, Article 47, Paragraph 2, uh, according to which a mercenary is motivated to take part in hostilities essentially by the desire for private gain, contrasts striking with our assumption that foreign fighters are instead moved by other and different factors. Part two also deals with the issue of children recruited in the ranks of uh, armed forces and armed groups fighting abroad, and with the international human rights obligations pertaining to non-state armed groups, including um, terrorist groups. And also in this case, we have tried to provide an analysis that uses the um, situation in the, Middle East, in the Middle East as a benchmark, as a case study, but then we uh, came up with results uh, that uh, can be used and can be uh, adjusted also to different settings. The third part of the book focuses instead on the supranational dimension of the phenomenon of foreign fighters, from the obligations under international law of the foreign fighter's state of nationality or habitual residence, the state of transit, and the state of destination. And then it tackles the issue of which are the measures implemented at the regional level, for example, by the European Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the African Union. And this, in this part of our volume, we have also dealt with resolution uh, 2178 uh, in a chapter drafted by Professor De Guttra, our co-editor, in which he highlighted both the strengths of the resolution, for example, for the first time there is an explicit reference to the importance of adopting and implementing measures that comply with international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and refugee law, and also its weaknesses. Uh, above all, the lack of a definition of terrorism. The fourth part of the volume analyzes the way states are tackling the phenomenon of foreign fighters at the national level. And the first three contributions focus on Western European countries, Western non-European non states, and countries from the MENA region. So this overview reveals that, to use the words of Christoph Paulus and, and Eva Entenmann, who wrote the chapter on the Western European Union, and I quote, states have taken a variety of actions to combat the perceived threat emanating from the foreign fighter phenomenon, to deter and prevent potential travelers from departing, bring those to justice who committed crimes, and, to a lesser extent, provide for adequate aftercare and reintegration of returnees. And, unquote, thus placing the accent on the fact that many of the measures, most of the measures designed and implemented at the national level tackle the issue of foreign fighters through the lenses of retributive justice rather than restorative justice. The last two contributions of part four address two cross-cutting issues that are of paramount importance to all the states involved and affected by the foreign fighters phenomenon. The first issue is the growing number of national practices which are resorting to the denationalization of potential terrorists as a preventive and I would say also as a punitive measure. And the second issue is the impact that the foreign fighters phenomenon is having on internal displaced persons, asylum seekers and refugees. 
So the authors uh, actually question to what extent is it possible to strike a balance between the rightful claims of those fleeing from a world torn country and the uh, equally rightful claim of those states trying to promote security in their own territory. The concluding chapter summarizes the findings of our volume. And in particular, we stress that it is of utmost importance to identify and address all the factors that lie behind the decision to become a foreign fighter. And the identification and the study and the analysis and the discussion on these factors should inform the possible strategies to counter the powerful message that is conveyed by many um, non-state armed groups. So the fantasy of leaving the Islamic version of the American dream explains why ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, or whatever you want to call it, attracts not only foreign fighters, but entire foreign families which are actually lured by the idea of a true Islamic fair and welcoming society, free accommodations and free access to education for all. Unlike other terrorist groups like, for example, Al-Qaeda, ISIS is concentrating many of its energy and resources on creating a caliphate and in its leader's words, Syria is not for the Syrians and Iraq is not for the Iraqis, thus highlighting that the goal of this self-proclaimed state and absolutely not recognized state is to attract people from all over the world and create an alternative to the Western societies that in many, too many instances has failed to integrate ethnic and religious minorities, thus becoming a breeding ground for radical and extremist ideologies. So in order to counter in an effective way the narrative of extremist groups, it, it must be one of the top priorities which has been identified by all of our contributors and also by the relevant stakeholders who must devote to this task increasing attention and resources in order to further develop measures that aim at preventing radicalization and promote to the maximum extent possible the rehabilitation and the reintegration of the returnees. What emerged from our studies is that punitive measures still tend to outnumber preventive and rehabilitative ones, highlighting that the main concern expressed by all the states involved is to strengthen the security of both their borders and their national territories. Nonetheless, it is not a case that Mr. De Kerkhoff, the European Union counter-terrorism coordinator and one of the contributors to our volume, in its foreword to our book, has stressed that we are dealing with a generational challenge and that therefore there is a huge need to provide future generations with critical thinking skills. So many foreign fighters who go to a war zone are young and ideologically unformed persons and the combatant groups see converting them to their worldview as part of their mission. This is the reason why ISIS has set up many jihadi camps and also to train uh, children to the true Islamic values, but also on how to use weapons. And ISIL, ISIS is also creating and setting up schools where the lessons are taught entirely in English to attract foreign families and disseminate its message. So if a terrorist group is investing so much in education, it is just logical to infer that uh, the states affected by this phenomenon and the international community at large should double their effort in the sense of creating and implementing measures that place the accent on education and uh, integration. It is our hope as editors and contributors to this volume that our work will contribute to promote knowledge, understanding and the coordination of effective plans, including sharing information and lessons learned, able to focus not only on the crimes committed by foreign fighters, but also on the reasons behind this choice. And the hope is to tear apart any metaphorical and unfortunately in some cases real wall that divide peoples, cultures and religions. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this, also for the nice compliment. Uh, Professor Barker, also many thanks uh, for having contributed to the book and for having accepted the invitation. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Christoph. And um, I would also like to thank the Officer Institute for uh, hosting uh, this uh, book launch uh, together with the ICT. And also would like to thank Officer Press for printing this book and, and publishing this book. 
Um, so uh, our chapter, Mark and I uh, wrote, is about the magnitude of the problem, and um, and that's worth uh, a, a chapter because what we've seen in the last couple of years, tens of thousands of people that have gone to Syria, Iraq, also some other places to join this um, fight in in that part of the world is uh, unique. Um, we have seen, of course, in the past. Uh, uh, places like Spain, uh, Afghanistan, but this is really unprecedented. Um, also in the short time uh, span uh, that we've seen so many people from so many countries going to these places. Um, and also the, the nature of the fight, of course, n not really comparable with, with Spain. But really a unique um, phenomenon and, and also um, a magnitude that is beyond the control of a lot of organizations that would like to limit the potential threat that um, is, is linked to this phenomenon. And we've seen, of course, foreign fighters, as, as mentioned before, it's, it's not new, but these numbers are, and, and they have uh, enormous consequences. So it's more global than ever. More than 100 countries uh, from, from Australia to Latin America, uh, uh, from China to, to Canada, and of course a lot of countries uh, in the region. Um, Tunisia, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, sometimes it's very difficult. We see lots of assessments sometimes. We've seen um, estimates where I really wonder where they come from. Uh, sometimes I see for political reasons numbers go up, then they go down again. Um, so it's very difficult to assess, but for a number of countries, they run in the hundreds, if not a few thousand. And for a number of smaller countries like Tunisia, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, this is an enormous challenge. And the same holds for a number of European countries, including uh, Russia, uh, including even the Netherlands, but especially France, Spain, uh, France, Germany, the UK. These are numbers that are beyond what intelligence communities can still uh, control. Uh, and sometimes you even wonder all these estimates and they vary. So do we really know what's, what's going on? So the numbers are high. And um, um, we in the Netherlands and lots of other European countries have, of course, the tendency to focus very much on European foreign fighters. And in this very short presentation, I would like to stress that that's not a good thing. Um, and we very much tend to focus on the potential threat posed by returnees to our country. And then we even focus only on those Dutch, Belgium citizens, French citizens that go back to France and Belgians that go back to Belgium. Well, unfortunately, if that was the problem, it was relatively limited, but we have open borders and we have a lot more than just European foreign fighters that might return. And I think we um, underestimate the damage that uh, and the, the, the tragedy that these foreign fighters cause to the region, to the countries where they fight, uh, possible spillover effects. Uh, if I may, um, in this country, we're blessed with a situation where we have very few terrorist attacks. Nonetheless, terrorism is very high on the agenda. Yes, we have jihadi terrorism. And one person was killed, one person. So, and we have a lot of foreign fighters. But these foreign fighters are responsible for more than 100 killings. We don't know these people. We have people from this very town, other towns, Maastricht, that go out there to kill other people. One guy killed 23. So Dutch jihadi foreign fighters, and we're worried they might come back and they might do something here. They might. But what we know is that they did and do, and that they kill a lot of people. So if the, the, jihadi, the Dutch jihadi problem is more than 100 killings, of which only 1% was aimed against the terror in the territory of the Netherlands, and only 1% was aimed against a non-Muslim or non-person uh, not from that region. And sometimes we, we, we are not um, focusing enough on, on that event and that pos uh, po uh, possibility that is taking place actually every day. And we also focus on Maybe Dutch jihadis might go back, or Belgian jihadis, or French jihadis. But what about these thousands from Tunisia, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, that we know from the past, some will die, some will move on to other places, but many will also try to settle down somewhere, maybe also in Europe. And then we're talking about numbers and unknown, the unknown cases that are probably going to hide in these refugee flows. Um, uh, some of them just to 
go to uh, places like uh, Berlin, London, Amsterdam to do dishes and, and, and just settle down. But of course some, because they're not welcome in their own countries anymore, might also come back to Europe. So these numbers, Europeans, but also non-Europeans that are fighting there, um, uh, are a potential problem for the future, um, for our countries, for their countries of origin uh, beyond Europe, and most of all for those places where they fight. So the focus is very much, I think, on, well, not even because of self-interest, but we, it's too narrow. And this phenomenon has so many dimensions, we have to look at that as well. So we have to look at what's happening there, and that's why it's very good that we stop these people, because they're doing serious harm over there. And then also add uh, the spillover effect, maybe Mark's going to touch upon that, but you know, these people, if they don't go back to their country of origin, if they don't die, if the, the, the situation changes in Syria and Iraq, where will they go? There will be a lot of other places that will, um, will not be happy to see them move there. Then the focus, and that's also one point in our uh, chapter that we would like to uh, uh, point out, is that our focus is very much on Sunni jihadi fighters. Very often you get the figures 20,000, 30,000, it's only about Sunni jihadi fighters. Well, again, it would be great if that was the only problem, still an enormous problem, but there's a lot of other fighters as well. Shiite fighters, uh, of course Hezbollah, we, we, we know, but um, Iran-backed groups, Iraqi groups, lots of militias, lots of people also recruited from Pakistan, India, faraway places as Yemen, that also fight there. And we're also talking about thousands. Very often we forget that as well. And that's just, just uh, there's no, I'm not making any moral judgment here, but uh, these people also go to these places and their numbers are also in the thousands. We tend to forget that. Also a recent group that is growing with some very strange people flocking to um, uh, those groups is, is those that join Kurdish militias. And the number of former US uh, military, Germans, uh, people that have some uh, political agenda, adventure seekers is also quite high. And I'm not saying that they necessarily pose a threat, but in legal terms, it's very interesting. How do we deal with that? So foreign fights, okay, we have got these young Sunni fighters joining IS or Jabhat al-Nusra. Also quite difficult what to, what to tell, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, and, and, and how to deal with that in, in legal terms. But what about all these people that join other groups or join Shiite groups or join and the same holds for uh, the Kurdish group. I can tell you the public um, prosecutors find it very difficult to deal with that and, and to, to make a stand saying, you know, do we like this uh, or not? Are we going to persecute this or not? So that adds to, um, to the trouble of or the legal side, but also in terms of, uh, for also for policymakers, there's so many other groups, even Christian groups, even people that join pro-Assad forces. Um, if you add all these uh, numbers, you get at a very, uh, then the dimensions will grow and the size of the problem as well. Actually, that's my, my, my main point. Um, the focus has been really too narrow, um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy you labeled also in the title of the book you just mentioned foreign fights. You see it also in the way we've been struggling with this whole term um, in, in many different languages. Um, uh, seen really hilarious names popping up. Uh, the, the, the best one is, I think, from Canada. What was it? Extremist Travelers. Uh, to me, it sounds more like a TV program, you know. Um, you know, the Australian part is, you know, cross swimming across Crocodile River. Uh, and the other one is some sort of like urban jungle in, 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 in some, some ghetto in uh, New York. And then episode three, you know, uh, Sniper Ali Aleppo, uh, Extremist Travelers Part 3. Um, but but we see really people a lot struggling with these uh, terms. Uh, in Dutch, it was really, um, uh, I think in the beginning it was those that travel that go outside. And then we defined and found out that they went to Syria. So there were those that go to Syria. Then they also went to Iraq. Well, those that go to Syria and Iraq was a bit too long. And then uh, I think, uh, and that's a term you avoided. And I think that's that's a. It's a good thing you did so, um, and, and I personally also speak very often of Tihani foreign fighters, so I'm, I'm even, uh, well, I want to make the point that we really have to look much beyond that. Uh, moreover, if you use that term jihad, which in many ways uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to use, I know jihad also has a very positive meaning, so it's a difficult term, but 
course, we mean the smaller and violent jihad. Uh, but it also gives almost some ideological credit to those that go. So it's very difficult to uh, to use that term. And, and again, there's so many more that go for other reasons than just jihad. Although a lot of Shiites that fight also will claim that they do so as part of their jihad. And so we have more than one jihad. Um, so I like it that you you, you uh, choose the more <laughs> neutral term. Uh, looked also at, at a number of other cases. And again, I think um, um, when we look at Syria and Iraq, it's, it's high time we look beyond only Sunni jihadi fighters. And that we also look beyond European fighters. Yes, many, of course, a reason to worry. But unfortunately, there are other worries as well, especially for other countries of origin. Uh, also for countries in the region, spillover effects, and especially for those in Syria and Iraq, of whom many have been killed by the hands of a lot of people that uh, thought it was a great idea to go there and, and join the fight. I'd like to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Edwin, also for putting matters in perspective. Mark, thanks also to you for being yes. with us tonight. And also for having contributed to the book, of course. Yes, indeed. You have the floor. <laughs> Contributing to a book, an academic book even. <laughs> that is quite something for me, as you can imagine. Uh, so thank you very much, first of all, for uh, uh, organizing this event. Thank you very much for inviting me also to even contribute to the book. I'm humbled by the presence of so many scholars. Uh, I, for one, am not one of them. Um, this was my first and potentially last contribution to an academic uh, volume, if only because it had 500 pages. It's 100 euros. That means 20 cents per page. But I think that does. I don't quite know how that sits with international human rights law. Um, I will look at three items. <coughs> trends and developments, as we said, since the launch of the book, so that's not that long ago. Uh, so the symptoms, the causes, and the responses, um, which coincides, I think, with, with some of the, 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 let's say, the path that the book has taken. So if you look at the latest developments, um, in as much as we know, uh, you see a somewhat decline in certain areas of uh, travelers, uh, in others, still an increase, and a growing recognition of the threat posed by returnees, no matter how you define them and how dis differentiated they are. It's not just returnees now, it's also relocations, traveling to third countries or via third countries back to your country of origin. And examples of attacks in at least uh, Western countries have illustrated the ties, the global networks between homegrown terrorism and travelers' audio. Um, now, the magnitude of that is still something that we try to, 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 to learn more about, to understand. And of course, not every returnee uh, is, a, is, of equal, uh, is an equal security threat. And because we don't really know, we don't really have good risk assessment tools and mechanisms, nor do we have the intelligence, policy responses tend to be better safe than sorry and with all sorts of consequences. If we look at the, um, the battlefields, if we may call it that, yes, the, the appeal of, of the caliphate, well, it seems that uh, that appeal may be dwindling somewhat. So you see some shifts in, 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 in movements. Uh, other areas now popping up as potential alternative caliphates. Um, there's, there's a war going on, definitely, in, in, in Syria and Iraq, and there's, there's a, uh, the Taliban would love to call it a sort of spring offensive. Uh, I think that's something that we'll be witnessing in the coming weeks and months, with the international coalition now really uh, taking on Raqqa and Fallujah. And there's no coincidence whatsoever, obviously, with uh, US election uh, cycles. Um, because of that, we see organizations like ISIL now reverting to basically a proven method, namely hit and run, in areas that they do not control. This was predictable. Uh, if they are under stress in one area, they need to either gain legitimacy elsewhere through hit and run tactics uh, as a way to attract further foreign fighters, but also to basically adapt to changing circumstances. 
there was a few years ago, uh, people basically defined Al-Qaeda dead and buried. Al-Qaeda is back, it's on the rise, and it's expanding in, in Western Africa, uh, inspired perhaps by, by ISIL in a way, uh, but definitely making use of the space that is being created. And yes, there are spillovers, and let's not underestimate them. Countries in the region, Jordan, Lebanon, but also others, are under huge stress. Just imagine that a 50% increase of your population within a couple of years in a very, very volatile and tense equilibrium to start with. How has that affected uh, Lebanese society and politics? Looking now at the root causes, well, I don't think there are many hopeful signs that uh, this foreign fighter phenomenon, which emerged out of conflict, let's not forget the Syria conflict uh, gave birth to it more than anything else. The Iraq aftermath of the Iraq war, combined with the Syria conflict, gave birth to this caliphate and, and foreign fighter phenomenon. There's no sign that that is going to end very soon, on the contrary. Uh, yes, a political track exists, didn't exist a few years ago, but is it getting anywhere? Uh, I'd argue that it isn't. And let's not forget, it's not just the Middle East and North Africa, it's other parts of Africa now as well. Uh, and don't underestimate the effect, it sounds silly perhaps, but if you decompose the root causes of the crisis in, in Syria, uh, I think El Nino and the effect it's having on, on, on drought, on migration flows uh, within uh, Africa, it should not be underestimated. Somalia is under huge threat, drought. It's undergoing the biggest drought for, for at least 20 years. And already, Al-Shabaab is making use of this by offering uh, free uh, food programs. The UN has warned that they need 100 million or more to basically counter the acts of, of let's say, this grassroots uh, uh, humanitarian assistance program. So, and obviously they don't do this out of altruism. Now, looking at the responses, I think since, since this foreign fighter phenomenon really began to emerge and really started affecting not just, let's say, the five biggest hit countries in the world uh, when it comes to terrorism, but also others, the knee-jerk reaction was and still is repressive. I think it's been, been alluded to already. It's very tactical rather than strategic, and it's, um, it's at the national level, even though there's an acknowledgement that the threat is multinational, it's transnational. But of course, security, providing security to your citizens is a national responsibility. And yes, there's a lot of talk about uh, interagency cooperation, cross-border cooperation, but it's, it's turning out to be tremendously difficult for all sorts of almost systemic and structural reasons. There's progress, but it's too little, too li well, maybe not too late, but it's definitely still too little. I think the ICT publication on uh, foreign fighter phenomenon in the EU illustrates that this focus on repression and legislation um, is there at the expense, perhaps, or just out of ignorance for issues of prevention. Prevention, rule of law based approaches, highlighted in the book, is, is something that you see too little. At that same time, you see something like a sort of parallel universe. It's on the one hand, a very enemy-centric uh, uh, response, let's drone them out of Dora Bora, versus the CVE, PVE, so the countering violent extremism, preventing violent extremism policy jargon, which isn't really materializing in, in let's say, real action, or not enough at least. Um, still searching for the million dollar uh, answer to the million dollar question and what works and why. I don't think there's, there's much lessons learning still going on. And the global architecture uh, lacks leadership, lacks clear vision and strategy. So we're at best playing catch up with the phenomenon still, learning more about it as we go along, but our policy responses are not, let's say, in sync with that uh, understanding yet. Um, so that gives us, us, the international community, still some credibility gaps as well, especially if we preach thus act the opposite. 
Um, I hope that happy note, I'll leave it there. Thank you.